Independent Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and of course your smart speaker. Coming up, the habitual politician George Galloway has created a bit of an earthquake in Rochdale after winning that controversial by-election. It means he can now return to Westminster and meet up with old friends and lots of enemies. What does this win say though about the current state of British politics? Also this afternoon, our prison population is expected to boom over the next four years as jails are being overstretched by foreign criminals and domestic convicts are avoiding sentences. We'll look at that in more detail. And the last thing you'll think about after jumping out of the way of one of those speeding e-bikes is that thing needs to go a bit quicker. Well, that's what the government are considering in order to make riding them more attractive. Will Guyot, our tech correspondent, will be here to tell us more. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your opinions and your responses. We're asking this question. What does the Galloway win say about the current state of British politics? Lines are now open. 0344 499 1000, text 87222, or on the socials at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Alex. Good afternoon. Labour has apologised to voters in Rochdale for not fielding a candidate in the by-election there. George Galloway, the leader of the left-wing Workers' Party of Britain, won the seat, declaring this is for Gaza. Labour withdrew support for its original candidate, Azhar Ali, over controversial comments he made about Israel. Party leader Sakir Starmer says Mr Galloway only won because there wasn't a Labour option. Pollster Joe Twyman told Talk TV it's hard to say what this could mean for the general election. Very unwise to extrapolate what this would mean at a general election or indeed in any other contest because of the unique circumstances. What we don't know, and we can speculate on this, but we don't know how Labour would have fared with a, uh, with a candidate that, uh, uh, that had... Uh, gone through the process without any problems and they'd campaigned heavily for. An inquest has opened into the death of Thomas Kingston, the son-in-law of the Prince and Princess Michael of Kent. He married Lady Gabriella Kingston in 2019. The coroner today said he died from a traumatic head wound and that a gun was found near to his body. Police say there were no suspicious circumstances. The funeral for Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has taken place in Moscow. Crowds of thousands chanted his name outside the church where the ceremony was held. He died in a remote Arctic prison last month. While Russia denies any involvement in his death, other anti-government activists in the country say he was murdered. Yevgenia Karamurza, the wife of Russian dissident Vladimir Karamurza, said the Kremlin want to intimidate them then this is exactly what the regime wants us to do, to get it, give in to intimidation, to give in to despair, and to give up the fight. And we owe it to our fallen comrades to continue the fight. A man who murdered his ex-partner and her new boyfriend has been given a whole life order, meaning he will never be released from prison. 27-year-old Katie Higton and 25-year-old Stephen Harnett were killed in Huddersfield last May. Marcus Osborne had inflicted over 100 injuries on the couple in a knife attack. The judge called his crimes horrific. Former glamour model Katie Price has been ordered to give up almost half of her monthly income from the adult entertainment website OnlyFans. A judge ruled she has to put 40% of her earnings towards paying off her debts instead. The 45-year-old was declared bankrupt in November 2019. And the Prince of Wales has celebrated St David's Day with a visit to Wrexham Football Club. Prince William downed a shot and pulled a pint in the club's supporters' bar alongside one of the team's owners, the actor Rob McElhenney. His co-owner Ryan Reynolds wasn't there, nor was the Princess of Wales, who continues to recover from abdominal surgery. That's all for now. Time for the weather next with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
There was some snow earlier today across western parts of Northern Ireland, even down to low levels, but it's mainly the hills we're seeing snow now as this feature gradually rotates and pushes northwards, slow moving and sort of stalling really across northern England later today with heavy showers working in across the south. In fact, these showers across southern Britain could be heavy with hail and thunder, quite gusty winds. North of that feature, at least some brightness improving across Northern Ireland and some sunshine for central and northern Scotland, but really quite cold wherever you are, but particularly under that wet area across northern England. And still some snow, as you can see, the northern Pennines, Cheviots, and as we head up into eastern and central Scotland tonight, so wet there, showers to the northwest coming down into Northern Ireland, and there will be a scattering of hefty showers across Wales and also southern and central England. And still a bit of snow over hills here too. And as you can see, quite cold and across more sort of clearer slots, there will be a little bit of frost around to wake up to tomorrow. Now, Saturday's forecast is a chilly one again, quite a lot of shower activity, particularly across more eastern parts of the country. Some western areas faring a little better with at least some sunshine in between the downpours, but on the cold side, four to seven Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. Now, if you were to search the phrase political firebrand in the Oxford English Dictionary, you might well come across the name George Galloway, now leader of the Workers' Party of Britain and the new Member of Parliament for Rochdale. This is a man who's had more comebacks than the Rolling Stones, a chequered career in politics, broadcasting and sitting down for a coffee and donuts with wicked dictators. Galloway is anything but dull. So, a brief history. He joined the Labour Party at the age of 13 and first became an MP in 1987, taking the seat of Glasgow Hillhead. He was instantly an outspoken backbencher, not always to the delight of the front bench. Gorgeous George, as he became known, mostly because of his personal life rather than his political one, was not a man to hold back. He also wasn't one to tow the party line, a staunch supporter, a staunch opponent of the first Gulf War and famously chastised, of course, for meeting the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein in 1994. We remember it well. He told Saddam he saluted his courage, his strength and his indefatigability. The Labour Party weren't happy. And when he met the Iraqi leader for a second time and started publicly attacking Prime Minister Tony Blair over the Iraq war, he was expelled from the Labour Party. But Galloway was going nowhere. He simply formed a new political party called Respect with a central anti-war message. It was enough to see him win at the seat of Bethnal Green and Bow, booting out the incumbent Labour MP Una King. And just days later came that famous appearance in front of the US Senate, where the Yanks accused him of profiting from selling million, millions of dollars worth of Iraqi oil. Now, it was always a bizarre claim, and Galloway gave them both barrels, and it was, to be fair, impressive stuff from gorgeous George. Just a year later came that awkward and just plain weird appearance on Celebrity Big Brother. Rumour has it, Rula Lenska never recovered. Now, would you like me to be the cat? Is it gone? Galloway was rarely out of the spotlight with copious media appearances on TV and radio programmes. He even worked here for a bit, but there was yet another political comeback to come. In 2012, he won the seat of Bradford West. That was at the height of the Arab Spring. Again, another seat gained from Labour. He's been a politician, a disruptor, a broadcaster for both Russian and Iranian state TV. And now, as of last night, an MP for five constituencies in five decades. But what does this win say about the current state of British politics? Let's open up the lines on that now. What are your comments on where you think this stands in the grander scale? What does it mean for Labour, for Keir Starmer, for the Tories? For Rochdale, lines are open. I'm joined now by political commentator Robert Taylor. Uh, Robert, of course, contributor at The Telegraph and The Express. Uh, he was widely expected to win this. And some say even before the official Labour candidate was discovered to be a mad anti-Semite, even before that, the, the smart money was on Galloway. 
Yeah, and it's the extent of his victory which has astonished people. Yeah, the smart money was always on him, but by such a large margin. Yeah. And Labour just nowhere, the Tories nowhere, an independent came second. Who? Sorry, who was this dude, by the way? Apparently he was, just, he just, was so, very thought, much... Where's this man come? I've yeah. never heard of him. I, I do this stuff every day. Very much campaigning on local issues. Good for um, him. But Galloway, campaigning on a single issue, it seems, mainly, yeah. absolutely stormed the field. And what I think it shows is that people are voting on questions of identity and culture as much as economics these days. Yeah. Of course, economics hasn't gone away. That'll always be a reason to vote, but identity and culture are coming up strong. Let's just, uh, before we carry on, Robert, let's just have a little look at what Galloway had to say last night in Rochdale. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. You have paid and you will pay a high price for the role that you have played in enabling, encouraging, and covering for the catastrophe presently going on in occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. Interesting. Interesting to use the word catastrophe there. Um, I, that, that, I would imagine, was a deliberate choice. Um, I was expecting him to say something stronger. Um, you see from that clip, though, Robert, I mean, he's a very... He's very mesmeric as a speaker. He's very compelling. You know, I, I sort of know him a bit. I haven't seen him for a while, but, you know, he worked around here when I was in the press gallery. I used to bump into him, have a cup of tea or whatever. Um, he's just very good. Um, he, he's not a guy I think I could fully say I would ever get to know. I don't know how many layers there are to George Galloway, but the one consistent has been his interest on views of the Middle East, um, uh, his uh, defending of mus Muslims in this country who he feels have been marginalised. Now, it's interesting, as people often say, you know, uh, George is sh surely a Muslim convert. George is a practising Catholic, yeah. and, you know, v v very habitually so. So, um, so it isn't that. So he's been consistent with that. But I, I, I just can't... I still can't fully work him out. I think the one thing he supports more than anything is George Galloway. Yeah, I mean, that's the big thing. He's an extraordinary disruptor. Yeah. And he's managed to win constituencies with two different parties of his, of his own creation. Correct, yes. Including this one last night. He knows how to disrupt Labour. He obviously wants to make life really difficult for Keir Starmer. Yeah. Whether he will come the general election, I doubt, but it's going to be uncomfortable for Keir Starmer in the next few weeks and months. Yeah, I was wondering, can he do as much damage to Labour as Richard Tice could do to the Conservatives? Yeah, well, that is... the. <laughs> You know, I'm sure that's what Sunak is hoping for. Yes. It's doubtful because reform has a big machine going now. Yeah. They are actually more established. Galloway has Galloway. Who yeah. else is going to have that kind of political stardom? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? And I think reform have found this a little bit in trying to find good candidates. I mean, it's interesting that in Rochdale last night, you had two former Labour MPs standing not for the Labour Party, Simon Danchuk standing for reform, uh, and, and they had an appalling night. Um, I'm not sure they expected to have an amazing one, in fairness. Uh, and, of course, George Galloway, who for years was a Labour MP, um, and you can see the state of play there. Even the Tories managed to... I mean, it's a Pyrrhic victory, really, managed to beat Labour. <laughs> it's not something we expect to see. Well, no, La Labour, they have the excuse, of course, they weren't really backing this MP. Yes. But even if they had been, would they have beaten Galloway last night? I have my doubts. So was it Gaza that did it? I mean, is, I think it, is it, was, it as simple as that? I think it was Gaza and it's obviously Galloway's ability to um, manipulate, not manipulate, just, just find a way of reaching out to voters in that constituency and beyond because he's quite an impressive talker and speaker, as you said. And in terms of the, the disrupting, I mean, I, you, you almost know that PMQ's next Wednesday, I, I'm pretty sure he will be selected for a question, um, and the House will fall into that eerie silence, as it only does for a select few, when he asks his first question, which I w would suggest... Uh, I don't think I'd get good odds on this, but I would suggest will be about Gaza. 
Yeah, it's almost certain to be, and there's one person who'll be squirming in his seat. It's not the Prime Minister. Yeah. It'll be the leader of the opposition. I don't think it's terminal for Starmer, but it's going to be really uncomfortable. Let's move... And we are taking calls on this, by the way. What do you think it means for, for British politics? What's the significance of the Galloway win? If there is one, 0344 499 1000. Can we go to this story, Robert? Britain's prisons full of foreign criminals. Um, our prison population is uh, estimated to be at around about... This is England and Wales. Could hit about um, 115,000 by 2028. At the moment, the last figures I was able to, to find on this is that the foreign prisoners uh, represent around about 12% of the population in prison. That's massive. It is. I mean, that's extraordinary. 12% of prisoners are foreign criminals. And that is a big reason why there's this new push to have foreign prisoners deported rather than in prison in the UK. But even if we did that, the prisons would still be full... Yeah. They're going to be massively overly full in the next few months and years, and it is because for years and years we've had wrong think with prisons. Yeah. And instead of treating prisons as um, an opportunity to reform and rehabilitate, we just let people... Uh, we just lock them away and then hope that when they come out, they're not going to reoffend. I mean, it is ridiculous. It is. Even from a, a right-wing perspective, it is just illogical. I know there's a... It's a, it's a very persuasive position, particularly if it's somebody you know and somebody in your family, to go, chuck them in a cell, throw away the key. I can kind of understand how those immediately affected by a crime would feel that way, but, of course, you have to divorce sentiment when, you know, which is why courts don't... I think it's called bad law. They don't consider the emotional side. You just look at facts, and the fact is that if you put somebody in a holding pen for a few months and then let them go again... Then no nothing's happened in that side. And they're going to reoffend. Other than they're a bit more annoyed than they were when they first went in. And there's this incredible statistic that over 60% of prisoners cannot read. And when we have them in yeah. prison, we don't attempt to help them read, apart from charities like the Shannon Trust yeah, yeah. that are doing their very best. But as a society, we don't actually take the opportunity to rehabilitate and teach them to read. Yeah. How bad is that? Do you remember when Jonathan Aitken went to jail, the former Conservative cabinet minister, um, and that, that was the, his big takeaway from jail. And I, he, he now works as a, a, possibly a chaplain, but he's certainly a man of the cloth. Um, and he, of course, became the guy on Sea Wing, or whatever, whichever one it was, who was writing letters for prisoners, who was reading letters for them, teaching them to read. He said it was a scandal, it was an epidemic. Nobody could read in this thing. He was about the only bloke that could. So that became almost his role. So he could have been the posh boy, you know, being kicked around the place, but instead he became the man that did them all a favour. And I think Geoffrey Archer had exactly the same Correct, experience. Yeah. But we've got these people in His Majesty's prisons and we're not helping them get an education. Indeed. What a wasted opportunity. Absolutely right. Last story here. Uh, the Navalny funeral uh, takes place, has taken place in Moscow. I didn't hear anything about a... Have I missed it? Was there a post-mortem that was carried out separate to anything? I doubt whether there's been anything like that. Because you might have thought that his family would have gone, hang on a second, you know, mm -hmm. suddenly our, you know, our loved one, the man who's Putin's, you know, greatest opponent, suddenly drops down dead, although you weren't in a particularly nice lifestyle of a prison system. But nonetheless, you might have insisted on that. But it's taken place. There were big crowds, heavy security, as one might imagine, big police presence as well. Uh, but we've not heard of any arrests so far. Very brave of anyone to attend that funeral, and apparently his family had a trouble getting a funeral director because everyone was scared of the government been, being linked to this opposition figure. Indeed. Uh, we're out of time, Robert. Goes very quickly. Good to see you. My pleasure. We will speak soon. That's Robert Taylor with us here on Talk TV. Coming up after the break, we'll continue to look at that by-election in Rochdale. We'll have a couple of different guests about the implications on what it means. In the grander scale, I'm Ian Collins. you with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Well. <laughs> the most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job.
Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia. This is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle. Let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which it said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march where we can say Hamas. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can't. Time. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> your <laughs> mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You'll be talking on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Now, if you'd ask me what would be my political predictions for 2024, a George Galloway comeback certainly wasn't one of them. The firebrand politician scored a huge upset, winning the Rochdale by election with over 40% of the vote. The Tories and Labour in distant third and fourth as second place went to the independent candidate, a Rochdale local. Dave Tully, good for Dave. George Galloway's campaign was heavily centred around the war in Gaza, made clear by his winning speech. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. You have paid and you will pay a high price for the role that you have played in enabling, encouraging and covering for the catastrophe presently going on in occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. So what do we take from the results of the by-election in Rochdale? Joining us now, polling guru, uh, Professor Sir John Curtis is with us. John, good afternoon to you. Uh, I mean, if we went back over the last 30 years, every now and again in politics, there are some curious people get elected, you know, once in a while against uh, Martin Bell suddenly pitches up in his white suit. Good Lord, you know, a couple of celebrities get a, a, a temporary moment in the political spotlight. We have seen moments, but Galloway is the kind of... the, the, the Well, we said at the beginning, more comebacks than the Rolling Stones. This is his fifth or fourth constituency, fifth if you count the name of the border change in his original neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's been there for five decades and he's back again. Yeah, his record is quite remarkable. I mean, just to give you one example, there are only six instances since 1945 where a party has won a by-election 
when it did not, uh, until that point, have any MPs in the House of Commons. And that includes, by the way, uh, the first SNP success in Hamilton and the first applied Cymru success in Carmarthen back in the 1960s. George Galloway is now responsible for two of those six instances. So it is something quite remarkable, his ability uh, to win by-elections um, from uh, 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 the Labour Party, as well as, of course, winning Bethel, Green and Bow in the 2005 yeah. uh, general election. Now, of course, what all these three constituencies have in common, uh, Bethel, Green and Bow, Bradford West, which he won in, uh, in the by-election in October 2012, and Rochdale uh, yesterday is they're all constituencies with substantial Muslim communities. And as you were discussing with Robert Taylor just uh, uh, recently, Mr. G uh, Mr. Galloway has a long-standing interest in Middle East affairs, long-standing had a pro-Palestinian point of view, pro-Arab point of view, and he is extremely good at communicating that to um, uh, Muslims and securing their support. And, you know, one of the fascinating things that will fall out of this will indeed be just to compare Mr. Galloway in the House of Commons next week with both Mr. Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer, yeah. the grey men of British politics who have been dominating our political parties in the last three years, certainly since the demise of Boris Johnson, are now going to be rejoined by one of the most articulate and charismatic politicians in post-war British politics. Indeed. And I, I'm sure, though, Mr Hoyle will make him take the hat off for the uh, for the moment, John, because that's, oh, absolutely. that bit isn't allowed. But none, nonetheless, is this... I mean, you mentioned, you're right, disproportionately big Muslim communities. But even so, this was a, what, 10,000 majority uh, seat that was being contested. He comes back with mm -hmm. a 6,000... I mean, persuasive stuff. He needed more than just the Muslim vote to make that happen. Yes, he, 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 he well, he either needed more than the Muslim vote or he needed to get uh, the, the, those living, the, those who identify as Muslim to be particularly strongly to turn out. About 30% sure. of Rochdale identifies as Muslim. In the end, uh, Mr Galloway got almost 40%. Not as impressive, by the way, as in Bradford West, where, you know, the, the constituency at that point already was more than half Muslim and Mr Galloway uh, got over uh, half the vote. But sure, he in the end, he outpolled the size of the Muslim vote. So yeah, either he persuaded some uh, non-Muslims to vote for him. And that wouldn't be surprising given his emphasis on Gaza and given that the Labour Party had disowned their candidate and given we know that at least there are some la uh, Labour voters who, do, who are not Muslim, who are also concerned about the situation in Gaza. So it's not inconceivable that indeed that his success doesn't just simply rest on the Muslim foundation, although without that foundation, uh, Mr Galloway would not be the uh, formidable force in this constituency that he's proven to be. Indeed. Uh, and I thought it was quite significant as well that the uh, that the man who came second was, you know, with a very impressive Mr Tully, with a very impressive um, uh, percentage, uh, was a local who campaign very much on local issues. I mean, this was, you know, in many respects, it's a great example of democracy in action, and the main parties sure. were given but, a kicking. But let's worth bear in mind, Rochdale has done this before. The last time that Rochdale had a by-election back in 1972, who did they let elect? One larger-than-life Cyril Smith, yeah. very much a local champion, former mayor, etc., etc. Now, of course, since his death, he's since, since, since been disgraced. Um, but again, that was very much somebody uh, campaigning on local issues and articulating the uh, wishes and needs of Rochdale. So this is a town that's got form in terms of its focus on local issues. Now, you know, George Galloway focused on both, but clearly Mr Tully, again, against the backdrop of the Labour Party having given up and also against the backdrop. And this, this is the one bit about this by-election which does read across to the other by-elections we've had recently, is the sharp decline in the Conservative vote. It's down yeah. by 19 points. It's the worst Conservative performance in a Labour-held seat in, in a by-election in this Parliament. Uh, against that backdrop, voters who not, weren't necessarily concerned about Gaza, but certainly disgruntled, unhappy, either about Rochdale or about the country in general, yeah, Mr Tully managed to... Um, uh, feed into that, and I right. think it's probably one co co constituency 
where that was indeed possible for an independent candidate to do. And just very briefly, John, if you would, um, is, is there a significance for uh, an, the impending election? Does this have any kind of obvious knock-on effect or a potential for a knock-on effect? It probably has more significance for the period between now and the general election rather than the general election itself, depending a bit on what happens in Gaza. I mean, I think undoubtedly what's going to happen is that the concern that many Labour MPs already have, particularly those representing uh, constituencies with many Muslims, uh, about Sakir's re reticence to criticise the Israeli incursion into Gaza, to call for a ceasefire without qualification, that pressure will increase and Sakir will find his attempt to, on the one, on the one hand, his very determined attempt to reconnect with the Jewish community in the United Kingdom, while at the same time hanging on to the support of Muslims, most of whom vote Labour, that task is not going to be any easier against this, and he's going to find himself under pressure on that. At the general election itself, well, we wait to see whether or not there is a slate of pro-Palestinian independent candidates standing, but as we've been saying, none of them will necessarily have the persuasive power sure. of George Galloway. And we have to remember that uh, virtually all of the uh, seats with mar large Muslim populations that Labour hold, Labour hold very comfortably. True. And assuming Sakir Starmer doesn't disown any of them, they ought to be able to hang on to their seats at the general election, even if perhaps they do suffer something of a dent and some of a political difficulty uh, because of the Palestinian issue. Indeed. Um, John, always great to gauge your views. Have a cracking weekend. Thank you very much. Professor Sir John Curtis with us here on Talk TV. In response to George Galloway's victory in Rochdale, the British Board of Deputies of British Jews said his election was a dark day for the Jewish community in this country and for British politics in general. I'm pleased to say we're joined by the board's president, Marie van der Zyl, who's with us now. Good to have Good you with us. Um, just Thank explain you. what was, was meant that. Why is it a dark day? Uh, it's a democracy, if you like. George Galloway was elected. What's wrong with that? It is a dark day, not just for Jews, but uh, for, for everyone. Even talk radio, I think, uh, sacked. Uh, George Galloway in 2019. Um, look, it's 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 a victory of uh, ignorance, if you like, over knowledge and what happened. And anyone who's got any access to the internet can find a whole host of repulsive views held by George Galloway on a variety of topics, not just Gaza, whether it be Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad, uh, Vladimir Putin, or rape uh, allegations against Julian Assange. And if people want to uh, choose to ignore all of that because they feel that Galloway supports Palestine, that's their choice. But he, he is responsible for absolutely a whole host, as I say, of vile uh, views, even in relation to Labour MP at Najshar. I remember in 2015, he, he produced what he said was her uh, nikah, a marriage certificate, uh, saying she was over the age of 16 when she married. Uh, she wasn't. She was she was only 15. And there's there's numerous uh, examples. Najshar, of course, took, took his um, yes. Bradford seat back in, in yes. 2015. Um, some people she would did. say, Marie, uh, that that actually, you know, sometimes people have uncomfortable views, but we are in a democracy. Um, he can have, you know, if he has a more um, sympathetic view to Putin, being one example you quoted, uh, he's not alone in that. It might not be your cup of tea or my cup of tea, but he's allowed those views. Well, let's just say they're not views that are based on reality. In March 22, not very long ago, for example, he, he's promoted, uh, I understand, a range of conspiracy theories. He said that the Ukrainian government had just imported uh, hundreds of Islamist uh, fighters uh, from Syria into Europe. And in, even going back in time, in 2013, he claimed that chemical weapon attacks um, were not carried out in Syria by the Assad regime. Okay. There's a lot of misinformation uh, here. This goes back a long time. Uh, what he's promoting is is not a recent uh, a recent thing. And let's face it, he's only really got in uh, because the Labour Party unfortunately had to rightly suspend their their candidate uh, and withdraw their support from Azhar Ali and couldn't put in uh, a good candidate. And I'm sure that they will make sure that they do so. 
uh, at the next general election. So, I mean, I, I get it. You, th you think Galloway is bonkers, and that, that's fine. But, of course, down in the House of Commons, as we know, Marie, there's quite a lot of bonkers characters down there as well. He's, he's not, he doesn't sit alone on that ticket. Well, he may not, but it's up to the rest of us to make sure and have faith in our MPs that they can deal with such a divisive, truly awful uh, okay. politician who has promoted so so many things based on nothing more than uh, division and misinformation. Uh, he, this is indeed, I think, a bad day, not just for Jews, but for all of us to have someone like him elected back into Parliament. OK, Marie, thank you. Marie van der Zaal with us here on Talk TV. Mr Galloway, of course, is not here to defend any of those comments, which I know he would do, well, he may say, I can't be bothered. We did invite him onto the programme. We have yet to hear back from his office. Now, moving on, our overcrowded prisons are set to get even busier over the next four years with foreign criminals contributing to a boom in our inmate population. These are official government estimates released today. Predict the number of convicts in England and Wales could hit up to 115,000 by March 2028. That's more than 26,000 over capacity. Here's where it gets interesting. Nearly 10,500 Foreign offenders are costing the taxpayer about £500 million a year. So we have a massive disproportionate number, 10,500 of the 87,000 in jail at the moment are foreign criminals. What's that, about 12%? It's an extraordinary number. How is this happening? Uh, let's meet a former Scotland Yard detective, Chief Inspector Mike Neville, on this point. Can you shine any light on this, Mike? Do foreign crims come over here because they think there's rich pickings or they're going to get away with it? Why do we have such a big disproportionality of foreign criminals representing Sea Wing than anyone else, it seems? Well, you have a big major problem with the uh, Albanian criminals. So of the 10,000 that you say there, there's about uh, 1,500 of those are Albanians. Uh, they know it's a very lucrative uh, drug market uh, and they can use uh, violence. And of course, if they're arrested, they won't be treated in any way like the Albanian police would uh, ruthlessly uh, deal with them. So it, it, Britain is seen as a very soft touch. And we know that there are uh, Albanians and others who are deported and they are... Um, uh, and they, they come back to the country and carry on their wicked uh, ways. We also know that things like uh, professional um, pickpockets uh, will travel around uh, Europe and uh, go to major cities. Uh, and, and they know that, again, in, in places like the United Kingdom, even if they're caught, they'll receive quite a... Uh, pathetic sentence. Uh, but the key thing is, is that we've got to get rid of these people because, as you've highlighted, they're costing a fortune. And now we've got a ridiculous situation under a Conservative government who they say they're going to get rid of uh, sentences up to uh, 12 months. So, you know, they, they wonder why shoplifting is out of control and things like that committed by our own people and foreigners because people know there's no consequence to being caught. Spot, absolutely spot on. And the, and the bit... Uh, and this is the kind of thing that, you know, utterly... Uh, plays havoc with my hippocampus, to be honest, Mike. I, 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 it keeps me awake at night. The idea that you don't... Once somebody has completed their sentence, you don't just chuck them out. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. Because, I mean, there are cases where it does, and the Home Office would probably regale us with some impressive figures, but mostly it doesn't, and there's usually reasons behind it. I can't be thrown out because of my human rights issues. I can't be thrown out because if I go back to Iran or something, um, I'll be killed or I'll be tortured. I can't go back because I've got family in the UK, so I've got the right to a family life. How many times have we heard that old garbage come out the mouths of some of these characters? Uh, why? I mean, this is a nonsense, right? Ten and a half thousand people, at some point, most of them will be coming out of jail. Surely the first thing you do is send them back to their country of origin. Well, again, you follow the money, uh, of course, Ian, because there's a whole industry around keeping these people in, immigration lawyers, human rights lawyers. The solutions are quite simple, really. You know, if me and you took over the government for the day, I'm sure the first thing we'd do is withdraw from the human, uh, European Convention of Human Rights. These things were designed for asylum seekers and the like when we had three or four people escaping the Soviet Union as a, as a defector and coming to this country. They were not designed for people just coming across here on air on uh, 
other aircraft, committing loads of crimes, uh, coming across the Channel Tunnel. And, and to be quite honest, if people, it would save us a fortune if we said to these people, yeah, you've got a family life, right, we'll pay for you, you're going, you're being deported, and we'll pay for all your family to go back uh, whence you came. And it, because I think that everybody, the taxpayers, the, everybody just feels they've been taken the mickey out of. The harder you work, the more decent you are, the more law-abiding you are, the less you get. And everything is focused on those who bring misery and trouble. We've got enough of our mm. own criminals and villainy in this country without importing it all from the rest of the world. We need to be rid of these people. Absolutely. And, and the crazy thing is, uh, and this just seems to be how governments consistently work, Mike, uh, it's going to get worse. And to, to compound the misery, we've been given notice of this. So you'd think, ah, well, that's at least one consolation. We've got notice of it, so the government can spring into action and sort this thing out. But, of course... We know that won't happen. So even with notice, even with half a decade to prepare for this, they still can't. How do we get to a situation here where, where you've got 89,000 uh, prison places and we know at 88,000? If that was a business, the people would be sacked that you've allowed this business to go on so we're at absolutely at crisis point. How did this ever happen? We've been failed. I mean, you, you would think the Conservatives, the alleged party of law and order, would have sorted this out. But we're told they're going to build these super prisons. But, of course, the super prisons are a year uh, out, of, uh, out of planning or whatever else. And it's a complete mess. And what happens is, of course, if you live on that council estate in Bolton or Brixton or wherever in the world, there's these people who are dealing drugs, stealing, causing misery, and your life becomes miserable because the government has failed to deal with this and, and make sure that those people go away. Because I used to speak to criminals, they used to give me information, but I used to speak to them about their life. And one thing that one criminal told me is this, the only thing criminals fear is going to prison. So all yep. these community sentences are nothing but a joke. It's locking Agreed. these people up that teaches them a lesson. No, but I know a few lawyers who would give us an argument on that, Mike, but, hey, they don't know what they're talking of about either half the time. Of course they would. <laughs> of course they would. <laughs> There's more money in, that, in it for them if they uh, keep yeah, them Well, indeed, yeah. It's, it's literally how they live. Uh, Mike, always a pleasure. Have an amazing weekend. Mike Neville, former cop Thank with you. us here on Talk TV, coming up after the break. All eyes are on Bahrain with F1... Qualifying just 15 minutes away as under-fire boss Christian Horner fights to save his career. So how did an anonymous email uncover this sexting scandal? Our tech expert will reveal all in a couple of moments' time. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs>
There are no banners calling for and the they re will release not of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, Hamas. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we condemn Hamas. Not, Hamas. Sorry, no, I, I'm sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can't. Like, good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your mind. mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and, of course, your smart speaker. Uh, we'll got our technology correspondent with us in a few moments' time. Uh, let me just do a few texts. Reference George Galloway. Uh, only gone and got himself another parliamentary gig down Rochdale Way this time. Yes, yeah, fifth time um, he's been elected in over five decades. He is the boomerang politician. And here he is again, ready for another innings down there in Westminster. What does it mean? What's the significance of George Galloway? Now, some might just say, well, is there any? He got elected. That's it. We know what his views are on a whole range of things, particularly the Middle East. Um, that might explain much of it, not all of it. He has other views on things. Does it matter? Well, what does it mean for Labour in particular? What does it mean for the Tories? What does it mean for British politics? Uh, Michael says, George Galloway is a Catholic. He is supportive of the Palestinian cause. Uh, just for your information, many Palestinians are Roman Catholics. Unfortunately, not many people in the UK knew that. That's the crux of the problem. I, I get that, Michael, but I don't know how many Palestinians... or a significant number of Palestinians are Catholic um, for that to be the reason why George has an interest in the area. But, yeah, I mean... De religions of all persuasions exist in places you might not uh, at first think. Iraq was a good case in point, uh, which was largely a, largely a, a non-religious uh, place with no dominating faith in the governmental sense of the word. Uh, let's move on then to our first story, a government plan to double the maximum of legal power e-bikes have drawn warnings that... Can we just scroll that back right to where we should have started? Just so I can... I want to read the story properly so I can give you the full, full story. Right, here we go. A government plan to double the maximum legal power of e-bikes has drawn warnings that it could increase the risk of fires and severe injury. The Department for Transport is consulting on the proposals, which would also allow e-bikes that don't require pedalling to travel much faster. What could go wrong? Joining us to discuss this, our tech correspondent is Will Guy. How are you doing, Will? Yeah, afternoon, Ian. This is a really interesting story, this one, because what they don't admit in this story is that the majority of the problems are coming from cheap, unlicensed bikes that are coming in from other countries. That's where most of these problems with e-bikes are originating from. These aren't the expensive e-bikes you buy on the UK high street. They might be the one you buy from an online retailer. They might be the one that you buy from a market or those kind of things. The cheaper, the cheaper versions, the ones which simply don't have the control on the battery. And there is no denying that some of those cheaper models have had problems with batteries and battery fires are not good fires. They're very hard to extinguish. I'm sure we've all seen videos of vapes and things exploding in people's pockets. Pockets, they can cause severe damage. So, I mean, in terms of e-bike, there's, there's more than one kind of e-bike, is that right? I mean, you just talked about the moody ones that people shouldn't be... which were probably you know, designed and built in a factory in Bethnal Green by Fingers McGrath and his chums on a, on a dark, rainy night. 
there's those ones that shouldn't be there. But actually, even in the legit world of e-bikes, you, you can get a full-on electric bike and then you get a partial electric bike. Is that yeah? I, right? I, I could see I could see you on a pedal assist one. Oh, you wouldn't the get me on of... anything. If I've got a pedal, get off. I mean, that's the thing, yeah. right? I want something else to do the work for me. Yeah, that will be a moped, Ian. That will be the, uh, the <laughs> difference between, between those two items. So you can't but... get a... I, 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 I genuinely, I'm not being stupid. I'm asking this question for our millions of viewers. Is this about... Can you get just a, like a slow moped, then, in that case? Uh, those are not technically e-bikes who wouldn't legally be able okay. to be ridden on the road. Now, they exist, and you often see them mooching about when you go into the, the towns and cities of the UK and you see somebody with a cigar on going around with their feet not moving on the pedals. But the ideas of a legal um, e-bike on UK roads at the moment is that you have what's called pedal assist. So you might be turning the pedals around at a very, very gentle pace, but the bike's turning at a significant bit of speed, like you can get you know, over 20 miles an hour as a result of that sort of pedal assistance. The ones that literally have the pedal still running are the ones that are currently not legal or are modified, because you can, um, like any kind of device these days, you can hack and change the software on it in order to do something like that. Yeah. Um, so they want them to go faster. Is that to make them more attractive? I think going faster will make more people want to ride them. It will be able to get you people like you who are like, I'm not getting on anything unless it's moped speed. Well, it's just, um, can I, Will, can I just, let me just go back a bit here. Right? When somebody first told me about the electric bike, I thought it was flipping Christmas. I thought, this is amazing. You just sit <laughs> on a bike and it, you just go along and it, it does all the work. You know what? That, that's just brilliant. It's a win win. And then somebody said, no, you still have to pedal. It's like, sorry, you, you have to what? Yeah, but you have to the pedal. point is right. What the, what's it's the that, point it's of like that? Any, it's like any working afternoon with you. You're putting in twenty five percent of the effort. Seventy five percent of the rest of it is done by everybody else. Ian, that's the yes, uh, absolutely the scenario right. I've worked thirty years to get, get to that stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on. The, I'm working on the remaining twenty five percent as well. <laughs> but surely, you, what you want, you know, I, I guess some people would say. They need to make them more, just more attractive to get more people on them. Is that? Yeah, I think I think they want them. They want them more, more on the roads. But okay. there's this really interesting. There's a really interesting statistic that more fires have been caused by e-bikes and scooters in London in 2023 than in any previous year. So wow. the demand for the, the vehicles are going up, but the the air, the, the problems are, are getting bigger too. And don't buy anything electric off eBay, you know, like that because. You just know, and as you rightly say, most of the ones that blow up are, are not, you know, the legit manufacturers. They're something knocked up in, you know, some some horrendous estate in northern China somewhere, and then shipped out around the world. Uh, buy buy legit, really. That's the advice there, Will. Isn't yeah, it? no, that is definitely the advice, hundred percent. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Christian Horner here. Um, this is a confusing story uh, because Christian Horner was in all sorts of trouble. Uh, F, uh, Red Bull, the F1, uh, Red Bull boss, of course. Um, they, they had suspended him or said, you know, stand down for a bit. We're going to have an investigation. There's been some accusation of um, domineering um, behaviour. Uh, he denied that. There was no suggestion it was sexual or anything like that. It was just like, you know, is this guy a little bit too brash in the office? That's certainly how I think many people took it. Red Bull did an investigation. They said, nothing to see here, Governor. Christian comes back. Somebody somewhere clearly thought this was an injustice, so they decided to release a load of WhatsApp messages and, dare I say, photographs of what um, or who Mr Horner had been communicating with and the kind of things he'd sent. Um, doubtless this was somebody who was not happy with Red Bull's conclusion that there was nothing to see here, Will. What's interesting about this, if this material is genuine and it's the same material that was submitted to some kind of inquiry, you have to feel for the person that felt it potentially wasn't fairly dealt with. But the challenge you face in a situation like this now, Ian, the number of people searching online for it, it was uh, trending on X, it was uh, appearing on all sorts of uh, international social networks, not just the ones we typically see here in the UK. Um, you sort of begin to lose what's real 
if it's real or not. Like what was in the original pile of evidence and what's been added or scurrilously yeah. added by somebody else. But what this does go to show is the power of anonymity or short term anonymity on the Internet, because this was all released by an email address. Um, a Gmail email address from Google. Now, in theory, depending on even how that person has bounced that email address around the world to, 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 to disguise their identity, there'll be some rough understanding if there is a legal case or a police request to find out what location that came from. So it's going to be very interesting to see what or if anything unfolds of this. And it also importantly, if Christian Horner keeps his job, it's a big weekend in the world of Formula One, and this was clearly timed to drop uh, at a it, very indeed. key and, point. And of course, for, the, for those who've searched out the... And, and here becomes the next problem, because of the digital world we live in, you just know that as we speak, I would bet you there's at least a thousand, <clears throat> excuse me, a thousand WhatsApp messages that didn't come from that, that somebody has made yeah. up to look like that already out there. That will get more. Uh, there will be photographs that are nothing to do with this. And then you get into that strange battle in your own head um, and in the news agenda. Well, hang on, which ones are real? Are any of them real? Mr Horner, I'm sure, will say, well, that is certainly not real. Why would I send something like that? that's so easily e easily connected to me. Um, but, of course, just when you think people wouldn't be stupid with technology because we've all seen the bear traps, people consistently and continually are, Will. They are. Technology, there's, there's all sorts of, um, you know, things that concern me about the world of technology. This story is interesting because clearly he's not been concerned about sending WhatsApp messages mm. to somebody. Um, but then you go into our third story of the afternoon, and this one's been uh, really eye-opening for me. Snapchat was flagged in nearly half of all child abuse image crimes in the last year. That and that's is... according to the NSPCC. Listen, well, we, we've only got about 20 seconds. That absolutely, it, it shocked me. But, well, it, it did and it didn't. I mean, you can sort of see how this has happened. But bearing in mind Snapchat was something that was meant to be designed f as a fun social media experience for younger people. Um, and it's clearly turned out to be a nefarious and rather dangerous place. We need tighter regulation, Ian. It's, it's apparently very clear. And what is the deal there? I mean, every time you hear a Zuckerberg being, you know, questioned by Congress or anywhere else for that matter, uh, they say, oh, we take this very seriously. Musk would say, I take this very seriously. They've got algorithms that you could never have imagined half an hour ago, but they can't stop this kind of thing. There's there's a lot in place and all the networks are doing a lot, but they're clearly not doing enough. Yeah. If Snapchat can be flagged in half of cases, there needs to be bigger fines. There needs to be a bigger impetus to get these uh, organisations to change how they deal with this stuff. Stop, uh, top stuff and absolutely spot on. Will, thank you very much. That's Will Guyard, our technology correspondent with us here on Talk TV. Thank you for watching. We're out of time. I'm back on Tuesday. JJ Anasiobi is in the hot seat on Monday. Vanessa Feltz is next. Have a great afternoon and a great weekend. Goodbye. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way.
couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham, just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit. You know?